So uh, welcome everyone to this uh, second lecture in the online lecture series that we call Metallic Microstructures, the European Lectures Online. My name is uh, Joachim Ullqvist and I'm with the, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. And I should also say that uh, we have already set uh, the third lecture in this series and that will be given June 17th by Dr. Jul Jensen yeah. from DTU in, in Denmark. So please put that in your calendar. So on behalf of the organizers, I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Baptiste Go from uh, Max Planck Institute für Eisenforschung in Düsseldorf, Germany. Dr. Go has a PhD in physics from the University of Rouen in, in France. And he is now the leader of the Atom Probe Tomography Group at the Institute. And in addition, he also holds an honorary visiting academic position at the University of Oxford. And the title of his lecture is Introduction to Atom Probe Tomography, Performance and Opportunities in Characterizing Microstructures. So with that, I leave the word and screen to Baptiste, please. Good. Um, cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, uh, Joachim and everybody. Uh, I'll try to be mildly entertaining while also being informative. Um, and I'm, it's, it's a, the talk is really an introduction to Atom Probe. And um, also, I try to reflect a little bit on, on what it might mean in terms of uh, performance and how this can relate to what we can do with the Atom Probe to characterize microstructures. Um, and so I'll try to <laughs> take any questions that you have at the end. Um, in between, uh, you know, I, I don't know, shout if you have a, a big problem or if I say something really stupid. Um, so, yeah, there's still some microphones that are not off. So please, can you mute yourself? Uh, that would be better because it's quite disturbing actually. Um, thank you. So um, effectively, as Joachim said, I'm based at the Max Planck Institute for Eisenforschung, which uh, believe it or not is on Max Planck Strasse, right there in Düsseldorf. So very close to the Netherlands and Belgium and not far from my hometown, somewhere there. Uh, and so not far from Rouen, where I think a couple of people are from and based uh, right now. And um, that's what the uh, wonderful campus looks like. So we are a bit more than a hundred years old now, uh, but we only moved to Dusseldorf in the thirties. And the Institute is uh, separated in, in four different departments. Here is uh, Jörg Neugebauer who does all sorts of uh, computational material science type things. Uh, this is Gerhard Dehm who presses on little bits of, of materials to look at the way they deform with these big microscopes. Uh, this was Martin Stratman's department that is now um, in between ghost town and, and revival. Um, but Martin Stratman is now the president of the Max Planck Society, so his department is uh, on the way down. Um, and that's us here in the middle, uh, microstructure physics and alloy design. And so uh, that's what the institute looks like uh, from the front. It's really red break, 1930s Germany. It's beautiful. Uh, that's where we do atom probe. I'm pretending to work here, but I typically don't do that. I sit my ass on a chair and just, you know, try to <laughs> support the, the people in the group. And uh, that's where we can forge blades to go and, and fight the evils of, uh, of the world. And that's basically what we tend to do at the Institute. We make new materials, try them, test them, and then we go down to uh, atomic scale characterization to try and understand the, the different processes and the properties of the, the materials. So why, why do we want to do atom probe? That's a, a fair question. And I think many people would, would wonder this. So I guess it's quite important to start somewhere. Um, so I guess most of this audience would know this, but atoms in most materials that we, 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 we are interested in uh, are arranged on a crystal lattice. And then there's a whole bunch of ways where these atoms can be arranged uh, on, on this crystal lattice. And then there's a whole bunch of defects where atoms can be missing, for example. There might be substitution of one of these uh, lattice atoms by another uh, element, for example, or these elements can go in between the main atoms from the lattice, and then there can be structural defects, such as dislocations, for example, extra half plane uh, somewhere within the, the structure. It can be faults in the way the atoms are stacked. 
And then these crystals will all organize in a specific way with a specific orientation. There are all of these regions there that can be of interest, the junction between two grains, grain boundaries, or defects, uh, defective regions, precipitates, for example, um, that can form secondary phases. And then how this interacts with the environment through interactions with the surface, for example, cracks. And all of these in principle, not all of these, but some of these can in principle be analyzed by atom probe tomography. The difficulty when we start considering microstructures is, is the range of scales uh, that are involved from just a few atoms to millimeters, meters sometimes. And so to address these uh, questions about microstructural characterization, we typically need to think about an array of different techniques that we can use. And some of those would be listed here. So many people would have used or heard of a uh, scanning electron microscope and the, the typical techniques that are associated with it. Uh, for example, energy dispersive spectroscopy, where we look at the X-rays that are re-emitted by the sample. And then we, we look at um, what is re-emitted to derive locally an idea of the, the concentration of the composition of the material. Uh, we can do this also in a, in a TEM, so in transmission through the sample. And then there are also a whole range of techniques uh, associated to ions. And so, for example, SIMS, where we take a, a source of ions, send them onto the sample, and then look at whatever comes off and do a, a spectroscopic analysis of this. And all of these techniques have a certain range of detection of sensitivity in terms of the chemistry that they can uh, measure. And the types of size of features from this micro list of microstructural features that might be resolved. And there's a there's a big gap here, and atom probe tomography actually sits somewhere there. So we can look at small features, about a nanometer to tens of nanometers in size, and we can go in terms of uh, precision and sensitivity in the tens of ppm range, typically. And I'll get back to that a bit later. But that basically positions why we want to, what, what sort of, of microstructural features or, or of interest, uh, property enhancing typically, we might be able to address and, and look into uh, with the atom probe. Again, uh, many of you would have seen a, a, a transmission electron micrograph. So this is a, a precipitation strengthened steel uh, that's been aged. We have formed all of these particles. We can do TM on this. Uh, some of you might wonder why the heck we are doing TM on something that's so pointy and, and not that pretty. Uh, there's a good reason for this and I'll get back to that afterwards. Uh, but now we are looking down the uh, all one direction. We can see these precipitates here all arranged. Potentially we can go and do some high resolution uh, TM, uh, STEM in that case, uh, high angle annular dark field. And you can see that the atoms are not arranged in the same way within the precipitates and within the matrix. But there's always a piece of information missing from this. Even if we were to do EDS, for example, or EELS to get the, the, the chemistry uh, analyzed, we have an averaging of, through the thickness of the specimen. So getting to know which precisely what is the composition of that atom that I'm seeing, I can't really do this. And so that's where the atom probe can come in. So here is an analysis, and that's why we're doing a TM on a, on a sharp needle, is so we can actually stick this in the, the atom probe afterwards. So I'll, I'll explain why we need that geometry in, in the next few slides. But the atom probe would be complementing what we can get typically from SEM and TM in scales. But mostly it will, what it provides us is the composition. What is locally the ratio of carbon to aluminum to manganese to iron? That's what the atom probe will give you. So how does the atom probe work? And that's uh, the next few slides would be about a bit of uh, physics of the field evaporation process. So the field evaporation is a bit of, a, of an odd thing uh, and it's not used very much apart from us daily. Um, but the idea is that if there's a, an atom sitting on the surface and we, we apply a high field, a high electric field, um, the atom here can start to feel the field in a way that would actually make it go dissolve. And as it dissolves, you have somehow an atom in a very intense electric field. And the electric field can be sufficient to ionize this atom. Typically, it will be ionized once first. And then as it keeps going and flying away, being projected by the field away from the surface, it can lose one more, two, three, four more electrons. This entire process here of the desorption and ionization is termed field evaporation. It is typically thermally assisted. So it's basically the vibration, thermal vibration of the atoms on the surface that will 
facilitate the um, atom overcoming its potential barrier, bonding it to the surface. And there are also reports of uh, tunneling effects, but that's not necessarily the, the general case. But to actually activate this process at low temperature that we typically use 40 to 60K, you need electric fields that are enormous in the range of 10 to the 10 volts per meter. So not very far from the field that actually binds the electrons to the, uh, to the, uh, the nucleus of the atom. So why do we actually use these sharp needles uh, to generate the, as, as samples? It's pretty simple. If you go back to uh, undergraduate level course in, in electrostatics, if you take a sphere of radius R and you charge it to an electrostatic potential V, the field at the surface of the sphere would be the voltage divided by the radius. So we can't really have a self-standing st sphere like this in, in vacuum that we can charge easily. That's, I mean, you can try, but it's not that simple. Uh, but what we can do is have a, a sharp needle and at the end of the needle, we have a, a curved surface that is almost akin to, to a sphere. And the field that we can generate with a, a specimen with a radius below 100 nanometers with a few kilovolts of voltage is going to be in the right order of magnitude. And here we just add a, a term that depends on the geometry of the tip and of the geometry of the overall microscope uh, that will be ranging between three and eight typically. So we can reach fields fairly easily with voltage of 10 to the 10 volts per meter with just a few kilovolts of voltage as long as we use a surface that is curved, sufficiently curved. So to prepare samples, uh, historically we we're relying mostly on, um, on electrochemical polishing of the needle. Today we tend to use a focused ion beam, so we, we couple this with an SEM, a scanning electron microscope. We can detect a feature of interest by scanning electron microscopy, and then with the FIB we can actually cut a series of uh, trenches from the sample. And we can then inside the fib, uh, come in with the micro manipulator in contact with this region of interest that we've cut free. There's a gas injection system in the fib. And so we can actually weld, more or less weld, the micro manipulator to the piece of material of interest and take it off. And once it's off, we can transport it on top of a support, slice a, a small piece of the material on this support. And so with one bar, the material that we've lifted out, we can make maybe five, six slices like this. We cut it, we move to the next support uh, tip and uh, or uh, flat surface, and then uh, we can make these little uh, uh, samples. And then we can use, again, the focused iron beam to actually shape this piece of material using an annual six succession of annular milling patterns into a sharp tip. So typically in, in a few hours of time, uh, you'll go from a sample in the SEM to five to six uh, needles that are suitable for atom probing. Once these needles are prepared, uh, we stick them into the atom probe. Um, so there's a series of uh, vacuum chambers to go from more or less uh, atmospheric conditions to down to ultra high vacuum conditions. And so we go down to about 10 to the minus 11 tor in the analysis chamber. The specimen is cold, is cooled down to between typically 20 and 80 Kelvin. And this is to prevent the atoms from dancing around on the surface as we start uh, the analysis. We want the atoms to be as, as fixed as we can. We have this very sharp needle, we apply the voltage, the surface atom starts to feel the strengths of the electric field. They will start to ionize and be repelled from the surface. And they will fly initially almost normally to the surface and then the trajectory is curved because of the, the uh, uh, geometry of the needle. And it's basically the surfaces of the, of the shank are going to repel the ions towards the center of the, um, or, or towards the axis, main axis of the needle. The ions will fly based on the distribution of the electrostatic potential, fly through a counter electrode that's positioned about 40 microns away on, on modern instruments. And we then collect all of these ions one, one after the other. So we keep increasing the voltage every time we are keep collecting all of these ions one after the other. And for the each of these um, impact positions, we record 
the uh, coordinates on the impact. Thing is, what we want to do at the same time is make use of the fact that a slow iron will fly very slowly and take a long time to reach the detector, while a, a, um, a light iron is going to fly much faster. So we can actually, if we can control the time when the iron is generated and we can somehow measure when it lands on the detector, we can measure its time of flight. So to, this, to do this, we either use high voltage pulses, so we maintain the specimen at about 60 Kelvin or something, and then we temporarily increase the magnitude of the electric field for a short amount of time, typically a nanosecond or so. Or we can also tightly focus a, a laser beam onto the end um, of the needle. And so we send a series of laser pulses. Every time you have a laser pulse that reaches the specimen, it will increase the temperature of the needle right at the end sufficiently to activate thermal uh, agitation of the atoms that will overcome the potential barrier associated to the electrostatic field. And then the ions can start to fly. So by measuring the time of flight between either a high voltage pulse or a laser pulse, and when the ion is detected, we can actually perform simply time of flight mass spectrometry. Once we collect the times of flight and the detector coordinates, we can basically, using a little bit of magic, uh, I'll get back to the magic, it's not magic at all. Um, we can build these beautiful maps where every point has been one ion that was detected. And um, we can see here, for example, carbon segregated at a, at a faceted grand boundary in silicon. Uh, it's one of these multi-crystalline silicon um, photovoltaic cell. But that's basically what the atom probe will give you. It's a nanoscale uh, compositional map in three dimensions. So that's a, a typical mass spectrum from a, a piece of steel. Um, there's a series of peaks corresponding to the different elements that we see, the different isotopes of the different elements. So for example, here we can see vanadium and chromium and manganese and iron. And the amplitude of these peaks corresponds to the number of atoms that were detected at that specific mass to charge ratio. So for example, iron can come in two charge states, manganese as well, chromium as well. Some elements will come also as molecular ions. So this peak at 18 is typically three carbons coming together, bearing two, two charges. And what, what we have to do afterwards is assign to all of these series of peaks a certain elemental identity. So for example, I've identified that this peak at 25.5 Dalton or uh, UMA per, per uh, coulomb uh, is, uh, is um, a vanadium. And then I have the series of peaks here corresponding to chromium. There's the isobar with iron. That's the default colors from the software. It's all pink. So you'll have to, apolog have to apologize because it's not necessarily super clear. Um, we can change this. I was just lazy. Anyway, so that gives you an idea of the sort of precision on the mass to charge ratio that, that we can get. And as I said, what we're collecting is this series of detector coordinates, the, the times of flight, and we, we also impose a certain voltage. So this we can measure at every time we, we have a, an ion that is detected. And then we have the sequence in which we detect the ions. And how do we build this tomogram, this point cloud? Um, we basically assume that an atom that we detect before another one has to be sitting above inside of the specimen. It has to come from a, a higher up inside of the specimen. The idea is that this guy has many atoms on top of it. So before it can go, we have to remove the other ones. It's quite simple and simplistic sometimes, but it, it works-ish. And so we collect the detector coordinates here. And what we assume is that we know how the atoms was projected, ions were projected from this emitting surface onto the detector. And we use just a reverse projection, flying this atom straight back onto an, uh, an assumed curved surface. So we process these, these ions one after the other. We put them back onto the emitting surface, one. And then every time we process one ion, we actually move this sur emitting surface down by just a tiny amount. And this tiny amount is proportional to the size of the atom and the fact that we don't detect all of them. And I'll get back to this afterwards. But every time we process one atom, we move this surface down a little bit and a little bit. So we just reverse project these impact positions onto a curved surface that moves down by just a tiny amount, proportional to the size or the volume of one atom. 
that's as simple as this. And we just do this sequentially. Uh, now we can even do this, monitor what is happening during the analysis. Historically, we are collecting all of the data and then doing the reconstruction afterwards. We still do that mostly. So there are a number of limitations. I think it's quite important when we, when we, we talk about um, how to characterize materials is how far can we push the analysis. Um, so the thing is, if you try to, to, to look at the surface of a, of a needle that you've made um, or a curved surface that you make out of an arrangement of atoms, typically on a, on a lattice, the, the surface will basically have a series of terraces. Again, I'll get back to this afterwards. The thing is, if you start applying the voltage and generating the field, the distribution of the field will not be smooth and it will have a certain roughness that will actually cause trajectory aberrations. Again, don't worry, I'll get back to this in a bit more detail afterwards. The detector that we use also has a limited efficiency. So we, we have a number of ions that will reach the detector and the surface of the detector, the entry point inside of the particle detector is a, a stack of micro channel plates. <coughs> micro channel plates are just a series of holes uh, in a glass plate and the glass has been doped and we charge this. So basically on the surface of the glass is full of charges of electrons. So every time you have an ion striking the detector with a few kilovolts of acceleration, it will trigger secondary electron emission. And the secondary electrons will then go down the, the, the channel, hit the wall, generate more electrons, more electrons, more electrons. So we have a cascading of electrons. And we can actually go from one of these ions into about a million electrons at the end, which we can detect more easily. The thing is, these, these holes have to be bundled together. So there's, there's a, a number of walls in between the holes, and that limits our capacity to detect all of the ions. So at the moment, uh, on, on state-of-the-art commercial machines, we have about 80% uh, efficiency, so we're missing 20% of, of the atoms. And uh, there are instruments now with even 90% detection efficiency, maybe we'll reach a bit more, but at some stage, this technology will, will reach its, uh, its limits. So typically, when we start with a bunch of points organized on the lattice, uh, after we've run it through the atom probe, we always end up with a bit of a, a mishmash of points. And uh, Let's get back to how precise we are in the next few slides. At the end of the day, that's a typical reconstruction that we have. So here is a, a nanocrystalline um, aluminum alloy, a 7,000 series. And you can see here we have actually uh, different grains. Um, I can remove the aluminum atoms. I can just see where the elements are distributed in that volume. I can see here as, uh, a higher concentration of zinc and magnesium um, and a bit of copper. And there are these agglomeration of, of these, uh, also of these elements. And um, these are actually grain boundaries. We can identify those separately. Um, that's uh, one of the precipitates that you can see. I've looked at it from two different angles and zoomed on it. Um, so we can actually select a region of the point cloud that is uh, of interest to us. And inside there, inside of the material, uh, in some locations, we can actually image atomic planes. So the resolution in depth can be really, really good. We can identify some of these uh, atomic plane families based on the spacing between them, but also based on the, the information we're getting from the detector. Again, you'll see this in the next few slides. Be patient, it's exciting. So again, that's another typical data set. Uh, we can then quantify how many atoms we have in the box. In every single box, we can define some regions of interest. We can superimpose onto the data sets of uh, iso composition surfaces or iso concentration surfaces. So this is a, a super alloy, nickel based super alloys that uh, has been built by uh, electron beam melting. Um, and we see a whole bunch of precipitates here, which would be uh, the gamma prime. There's here a grand boundary that's decorated with boron. And here is gamma prime. And here is gamma with the, the small gamma primes in, inside. So for example, I can take a, a cylinder, a cylindrical region of interest that crosses through the grand boundary here. And I can measure it. Please mute yourself, please, please. Please, thank you. Uh, <laughs> And so here I can actually see through this cylindrical region of interest, what is the ratio of chromium to nickel to aluminum to boron. So the boron is plotted here on the right axis. So don't, don't be misled. We don't get 60% boron at the grand boundary. 
Um, but we can see that here we go from gamma, which is uh, nickel poor and chromium rich into gamma prime, which is nickel rich and chromium poor. And right at the grand boundary in between, we actually have this strong segregation of boron reaching up to through 3% from zero basically inside of gamma and of gamma prime. That's what the atom probe is quite good at. It's looking at this concentration of light elements or typically boron at specific uh, locations within the macrostructure. As I said, we can actually find ways to define, um, to extract regions of interest. In that case, I've extracted only the points inside of the point cloud that are surrounded by this azo concentration surface that was defined as a function of the local composition in, in aluminum. So the ratio of aluminum to all of the other elements. And then I can look at the way the composition varies as I move in and out from this uh, iso concentration surface. So here I can see that this small particle would be as expected at rich in nickel and aluminum. They're not reaching the 25, 75 as might be expected. Uh, there are a number of artifacts with that types of calculations, which we can discuss later on if you're interested. And then once we are inside of the point cloud, we can also look, for example, here, I'm just inside of gamma prime here, and I'm looking at the way aluminum atoms are separated. What is the distance between an, an aluminum atom and its first nearest neighbor aluminum atom? And I can compare this, for example, to a random distribution. I can see here that it's not completely random. <laughs> and there's probably a good reason for this that I don't really understand because you know, there's not, not much reason for this, but that's a typical type of analysis that we can do. And we can actually, we have tests to know how far from random we, we, we can be. So that's why it's, uh, the atom probe is often used to look at early stages of, of nucleation. And that goes back to the lecture from uh, a month ago now, or four weeks ago, um, from uh, Professor Kosciusnik, probably butchering his name. I'm very sorry about this. Um, but basically, we, we can actually look at a, at a distribution of atoms and then see whether there are specific interactions that would lead to these atoms being uh, closer together on average, which might be a sign that they, they actually want to cluster and then help nucleate some other phases. So I, I'll get back to some more uh, details about what we can do with the atom probe. Um, as I've mentioned, we, we make this uh, curved surface from um, a, an, an arrangement of atoms. And we have typically atomic planes on the, in, inside of this lattice that we can see. And if you stack just spheres and make a sphere out of it, you end up with that, just a series of terraces that correspond to the different sets of atomic planes that are intersecting the curved surface. Um, and we can actually identify this, this series of planes and depending on the crystal structure that we see, you can see here some symmetries that we can use to actually um, identify which set of planes we're, we're, we're talking about. Some other people have tried to do this and it's actually commercially available, I think for about 900 euros or something, you can actually buy a, a Death Star uh, in Legos. And what you will basically do is model an atom probe tip. If you want to buy an atom probe, it's about 3 million euros. So actually it's probably cheaper to buy this and also much more fun. But when I go back to the point I was making earlier, when we have this series of terraces corresponding to different sets of planes, we actually would expect that this atom from the edge, which is going to be one of the first ones to leave the surface because the field is right there, very high, actually, it might not fly exactly like this because the path of lowest energy for the ion to fly might be closer to either slightly deviated to the right or this atom can actually shift on top of its neighbor and then fly. And this is going to cause sideways some trajectory aberrations that will lower the resolution that we can reach. And it's kind of st stochastic, so it's really difficult to predict. But what this means is that when we look at the detector map that we find, knowing that we have this series of atomic planes intersecting the, the curved surface, we actually see the trace of these atomic planes intersecting the surface because some of the atoms will be repelled right from the edge of this series of terraces. And that forms an absolutely magnificent pattern that reveals some of the symmetries of the crystal. And we can actually attribute to these series of um, 
uh, planes that we observe, uh, these poles and zone lines, we can uh, uh, give them a, a, a crystallographic identity. So that's a, a typical um, image from the detector for an aluminum tip. So you can see here a beautiful threefold symmetry. And as you start thinking about it, you'll be like, oh yeah, I've seen similar things before, like a Kikuchi pattern. Uh, which is used for indexing BSD maps, for example, or, or in the TEM. This is in the like due to diffraction or going through the reciprocal space. This is all in real space, just related to this, the, the symmetries of the crystal in real space. It's just yeah. the distribution of the field. Can you, can you mute yourself? Can you mute yourself? Nico, mute, you mute yourself. Uh, sure. So what should I do to send email? Uh, Nico, Nico, mute oh. yourself. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> ah. That's okay. That's fine. Okay, Nico, so I would just take mute your... yourself. Yeah, yeah totally fine. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Enjoy your vacation. <laughs> sure. Nico, mute yourself, please. <laughs> Maybe Joachim can do that as uh, yeah. you know. Um, uh, sorry. Um, anyway, so uh, I wanted to show you this um, pointer uh, arrow. Yes, so if I look at the way the detector map is going to evolve as I perform the analysis, you can see here I was in one grain and now I can see another pattern forming because I have crossed the grain boundary. The grain boundary is being analyzed right there. So I go back to this. So that's the top grain. And then suddenly you see there's another pattern forming here and we actually break the symmetries of the first crystal going into the second crystal. And in between here is the grand boundary. And I'll get back to some of that beautiful data from uh, Juan Zhao afterwards because it, it's really quite, quite cool. Um, <laughs> sorry, I get excited about stuff. Um, but the fact that we actually have an idea of the crystallography of the specimen is quite useful because for example, we can do um, EBSD beforehand, we can identify the orientation of some of these uh, samples. We can do a lift out specifically from some grains, and then we can orient the sample almost in full in three dimensions. And we can identify this series of poles that we find on the map. So this is work that Lutz uh, Marsdorf from MPI uh, got published recently. And he sort of pushed me to, to show this to you guys because I think it might be of interest to some of you. Um, and I think it's beautiful work. So I didn't have a problem doing it. But basically, he, Lutz uh, smartly selected a, a specific variant and uh, in this um, uh, low, low alloyed steel and looking at the very early stages of formation of the, of the carbides. And by reorienting the, the specimen afterwards, we could actually see, did use the habit plane of some of these uh, very early stage of uh, carbide formation. I invite you to read the paper for a bit more details, but we were not shooting at random. We could actually use the crystallographic information before the preparation, during the analysis to really extract a bit more information from, from the data. And going back to this data set from uh, aluminium, so it's a, it's a 7,000 series model system. That's the map that I've shown you before, where you would go from this 111 to another 111, but with a symmetry broken in between, the two grains are sitting next to each other. And that's the typical extraction of the information that we might be interested in. So this is all of the, all, all of the ions that we can show. Here we have superimposed uh, um, uh, an isoconcentration surfaces or a series of isoconcentration surfaces. And because it's all in three dimensions, I can then just crop a thin region of interest through the grand boundary and then just look at the distribution of solutes in this peak age sample. How are they distributed? At the grand boundary, look, we can actually detect some of these phases. There's copper inside, there's zinc and mag, and it's typically eta prime. And then we can even go down to looking in, in between these, these different uh, particles. Again, look right through, and here we can see some sort of weird uh, segregation pattern um, in between the precipitates where we have series of high and low concentrations of copper and mag and zinc. And sometimes when we are a bit lucky, uh, we can actually find the 111 planes on either side of the grand boundary and we can see that there's basically 11 planes 
in between all of these clouds of solid. So it, it's probably the, the junction between the, the two grains at, at, a, at a sigma 11-ish. <laughs> and uh, every time here, you have a cloud of solids that's being trapped at this uh, extra half point in between the two, the two grains. It's really quite pretty. And this goes to the next point, which is actually how far can we push this spatial resolution and the analysis? And um, I've had a few discussions in the past <laughs> with uh, Harry Badesia, who was saying that basically Adam Pro was kind of not so good uh, because its spatial resolution was not so good. Uh, he actually was very polite about it, but um, I took it very personally. So as I mentioned in some samples, something simple, aluminum, you can see these planes everywhere, all across one way, the other way. Every time we just see the planes where the series of planes intersects the curved surface, there are many reasons for this. We can perform Fourier transform, do more or less diffraction type work, and it works fine. But as soon as we start looking at more complex systems, it typically doesn't work as nicely. So here we, we typically can use tools to measure the interspacing by looking at the average distance between two atoms along a specific direction. And we can also try to do this not only in Z, looking at the distance between atoms in, in the depth, but also laterally. And the problem with these maps is that the signal to background ratio is very low, which means that most of the atoms are actually not positioned properly. Some of them are, but most of them are completely lost. We have lost a vast majority of the neighborhood relationship between an atom and its first neighbor in laterally, just along the plane. So the best resolution that we're gonna get is in Z and where the planes are actually being field evaporated in order, atoms after atom after atom. And this we can see, for example, in this analysis of a, of a, a T1 precipitates in this uh, 2000 series aluminum alloy, aluminum, copper, lithium, um, max silver. And we are going down here, the series of 111 planes and we are intersecting one of these T1 uh, precipitates. And you can see that the mag and the silver are right, segregated right there at the interface between the T1 precipitate and the matrix. But as soon as you go away from the region where the 111 planes are well um, imaged and, and well resolved, it looks like a mishmash of points and atoms. So we need to be quite careful when we interpret the data. So funnily enough, we, we published a first paper here, which actually said that silver <laughs> and mag were not segregated at the interface. And then we did the analysis again more properly in that one paper. And uh, we reported that it actually does segregate to the interface. So we have to be very, very careful and we can be wrong. And I've been wrong before. <laughs> um, and I think we all have been wrong before, but uh, that's, a, that's a very specific case where I think we, we were very much convinced that we were not wrong and we proved ourselves wrong within like five years or something. And this is because I think we didn't understand the limits of resolution as well back 10 years ago as, as we do today. And uh, part of this is uh, actually, it's quite funny that Fred is here and Xavier as well, I think. Um, they, they did this analysis of a, a ferrite austenite interface uh, in, a, in a model uh, around carbon manganese system, looking at this transformation interface. And I just looked at the data again from Fred um, after the paper was published. And what we can see is that if we look at this grain on top above the, the, the interface, you can see that there's a pole there corresponding to a certain set of planes. And then in the bottom grain, we also have another pole corresponding to the, another set of planes and they actually happen to overlap perfectly. And if I look through the data, just a thin slice through the data, that's the interface that you can see there. And I can see planes continuing all the way through the entire data set. And so what I did simply is look at the width of the composition segregation along the interface like this. As I move away from the center of this pole, this 110 pole, and look at the way the width of the compositional profile was changing. Simple analysis, but that basically was telling me, okay, when I'm at the pole where the planes are being analyzed in the right order, one by one, how, how precise can my measurement be? And as I start moving away from the pole where the resolution will worsen, how, how bad are things going to go? And so that's the width of the profile. And you can see that it goes to a more or less a minimum um, round next to the pole. 
And here we actually go down to something that's about two to three atomic planes right at the interface where segregation takes place. For the manganese, it, it varies a bit less, but for the carbon, it, it, there's basically like a factor of maybe four or five between right where the resolution is the best and slightly away from it, just 10 nanometers away from it. And that's because the evaporation, the, the evaporation doesn't proceed as nicely and you have a bit more trajectory aberrations as you move away from right the center of the pole. And actually by looking at the data more carefully, we found that there were probably a couple of series of dislocations because there was a slight misalignment between the two grains and these dislocations segregated quite a lot of manganese, maybe up to 10% and more, more carbon that's in between these dislocations. But here we have a full width of maximum that's like about a nanometer or so. Um, so I was pretty happy with that, or below a nanometer. I uh, was pretty happy with that. It also means that if we do our analysis carefully, if we prepare our samples carefully, and that's what we try to discuss quite a bit in that paper, we might be in a situation where atom probe won't suck as much as some people think. But these trajectory aberrations in some cases can be almost put under control. Um, but if I don't look now at a, at a material that has atoms uh, randomly distributed in the matrix, but where we have precipitates, if I assume, for example, that the field, the strength of the electric field I need to remove atoms from the matrix and from the precipitate is not the same, which makes sense because it's related to the local bonding of the atoms. If I start applying the field, a voltage translates into a field, the atoms from the matrix will start to fly early on. But then I need more fields to remove the atoms from the precipitate. So what is going to happen is that progressively I'm going to develop a different curvature right at the precipitate. And this different curvature means that the, the magnification will be different because the ions initially fly normally to the surface. So really like this, where here they are flying like that. So there is actually an overlap of the trajectories between the atoms that are flying from the matrix and the atoms that are flying from the precipitate. And as we keep proceeding, the precipitate can actually start to field evaporate itself and the atoms from the precipitate itself it also land outside of the image of the, of the precipitate. So we have this trajectory overlap that actually affects our capacity to measure the composition of the particle precisely, but also um, our capacity sometimes to image very, very small objects. And this has been well reproduced. This is a well-known problem. It's difficult to quantify because it depends on the, the local uh, bonding of the atoms, so the particle that we're looking at. Um, but we have these density fluctuations depending on whether the, the, the atoms from the particle require slightly lower field or slightly higher field to be removed from the surface. So if you are interested, you can invite you to, to wait a bit on, on this, uh, this topic or we can talk about it afterwards. But uh, last year, um, we started working with, uh, no, we've been working together with Frédéric for a long time now. But anyway, uh, we started putting together data from comparison between size of particles that we could obtain, for example, from small angle X-ray scattering or small angle neutron scattering. And we put this data against what we could measure from the atom probe using um, a, a protocol that was more or less the same to extract information from the data. And what we could find is that there is a, a, a hard limit in terms of resolution of the tiniest clusters that we can measure that is about 0.5 nanometers in, in all three dimensions. That being said, with the resolution being better in Z, there might be ways to detect objects that are smaller than this. But when we talk about you know, atom, like particles that are two or three atoms in size, uh, as might be the, the case for a very early nucleus of a particle, it, I think it's very difficult to confirm that these are going to be analyzable by atom probe without thinking very hard about it. So again, I think we, we made some good progress in understanding how, how good the technique works and how some of the limitations are going to affect our capacity to analyze um, um, interesting engineering materials, I would say. So all of these would be a series of different steels um, analyzed by a, a range of different groups, and we could just extract the values from, from the papers. And these squares are out data and triangles and circles as well for different alloys. So um, yeah, I'm doing very badly with time, so I might just uh, go very quickly towards the end. Um, just wanted to give you a, a flavor of what we can achieve now by combining microscopy techniques. 
So we looked at some cobalt nickel superalloys that were developed as part of a, a joint project with uh, colleagues in Erlangen as part of a, a collaborative research center across Germany. So we looked at uh, cribed samples uh, after quite a long time at uh, 850 and 400 megapascal of, 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 um, of stress. And uh, we actually see that the, the gamma prime that were initially cuboidal have stretched uh, and uh, they've rafted and just go quite quickly. And we did electron channeling contrast imaging in the SEM. So we could actually visualize some of these stacking faults that are sitting and crossing all around these uh, gamma prime particles that have been uh, um, rafted. And what we wanted to do afterwards was look at one of these things. So we actually went from one of the SEMs into the FIB. We lifted out this region. Um, by we, I mean Surendra Makineni, who is now a faculty at the, the Indian Institute of Science, because um, as I said, I don't do very much myself. Uh, and then we lifted this out. We deposited this on the TM grid. We actually could image inside the TM that we the, the specimen contains some of these stacking faults. And then we stick this not on this uh, homemade holder for our, our, our conventional TM, but on a double tilt holder for high resolution TM. And we could image the stacking fold being segregated with heavy elements from high angle and our dark field. And we could actually characterize what the stacking fold was. It was a, an intrinsic stacking fold. And then we could put this specimen right back into the atom probe. And what we did scratch our head for quite a long time, but basically we lost this first one because we had to clean the specimen after TM in the fib. So we had to clean this, so we removed the, the top. And what we ended up with was this, the end of this stacking fault inside of the specimen. And all we could see initially was this segregation of chromium uh, along a tube that was actually the partial dislocation right at the end of the stacking fault. And on the back of it, we actually could see that there was a depletion of aluminium. And then again, uh, we looked at the data in all sorts of directions through small regions of interest and measure the composition. Uh, we could effectively image the segregation of tungsten right on the fault, which explains the contrast in the angle and our dark field image in the, in the stem. We could also see that the, the, the linear defect, the partial dislocation uh, was segregated with chromium and uh, depleted in, in tungsten and aluminum and nickel. And looking ahead of this partial, we could also see a pileup of some of these elements, and in particular aluminum, while tungsten was actually segregated right there on the fault and depleted. So it suggested that effectively, as the, the partial dislocations move through the gamma prime precipitate, there's a reshuffling of the elements right ahead that drives the, the segregation of tungsten onto the stacking fault and um, the aluminum away from it. And this was actually explaining the segregation of tungsten that initially people thought would be coming from the sides and actually it doesn't really come from the sides, it comes really from the front. And that was to us quite interesting. Um, anyway, um, I'll just skip this because I don't have much time and I don't really want to spend too long on this anyway. So it's all on super alloys. We've done really quite cool stuff on super alloys in the past few years. So that's work by Surendra and, and Xiao Xiang, uh, where we looked at rhenium segregation to these, um, uh, again, the stacking fault and the, the, the partial dislocations in, in Krebs gamma and, and gamma prime precipitates. And um, we could actually correlate the amount of rhenium that we could find at the partial uh, dislocation to the creep rate. So an idea that the, when the dislocation start to travel, they, they might be carrying um, uh, rhenium alongside, the, uh, alongside it with, but if the dislocations move too fast, the rhenium doesn't have time to, uh, to cope and, and move fast enough to uh, stay at the dislocation. So anyway, this is all in papers you can read if you're interested. Um, anyway, so just to conclude, uh, atom probe tomography gives us this uh, three-dimensional compositional map with sub nanometer resolution. It's almost there, uh, but it's not really atomic. So if you read atomic, you can shout because it's not really true. Especially laterally, we lose resolution, um, but we can use it for bulk samples and thin films and oxides and a whole bunch of different materials. Um, the physics that underpins atom probe is not that simple. Um, so we need very, very clever experts like us uh, <laughs> to, to exploit the data. Um, but atom probe by itself 
is just a tool. It becomes really useful when we complement it with TM and SCM and maybe SIMS and XPS. It really provides one more piece of the puzzle um, to try and explain the, the microstructure property relationships. And overall, I think we, we can all agree now that the world needs more atom probes. Um, can join us. It's a beautiful and friendly community. We're all very um, smart and funny and good looking. So, you know, you're welcome to join us. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope I wasn't too, too long. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Matisse, for this very nice presentation.